30 Odd Minutes is sponsored in part by Digital Dowsing. Who are you powered by? For the next 30 minutes, we will explore the unexplained. From mysteries beyond our galaxy. To ghostly phenomena in our own backyard. We will dive into our psychic abilities. And explore everything from conspiracies to the just plain weird. Welcome to 30 Odd Minutes. If the truth is out there, we will find it. But only by sheer accident. Hey! Welcome. Welcome to 30 Odd Minutes. It's great to be back with you guys. Have you here aboard the mothership? I looked behind me just a minute ago, and I see that we are now hovering right in San Francisco Bay, and that looks like Alcatraz here behind me. With me, of course, piloting this vessel, Matt, Andrew, how are you guys today? There they are. How you doing there, Jeff? Good to have you with us. What's new? Uh, Not much. Just trying to stay uh, warm when we land in uh, New England. I'd like to get uh, somewhere where it's warmer and uh, looking into some investigations lately that have been getting pretty interesting. Yeah? Give yeah. us the 30 seconds on it. Uh, I've been looking into a case for three years. I've talked about this before in Situate, Rhode Island. And uh, we just had somebody who knew nothing about the haunting have a uh, ghost come up alongside them and ask them to do something. And the poor guy didn't even know this was going on in the house, and it kind of rattled his cage a bit. Nice. But uh, interesting nonetheless. Good stuff. Matt, you? Yeah, following up on a couple of abduction experiencers and uh, a bunch of sightings been happening. And I've also been uh, doing a little bit of, uh, let's call it, reconnoitering uh, around MIT, seeing if I can borrow some of their equipment to test some samples from the old Rendlesham case. It almost sounds like Ghostbusters with a, a different theme. And when you so, say uh, borrow, you don't mean with like a crowbar? Or... No, what I mean is let me use the equipment okay. there. So they'll know about it. When yeah. You, yeah, okay. Right. Well, very good. I like it. Okay. Uh, have we heard from anybody this week? Andrew. Oh, yeah. One you. second. We'll pull this out of the, the reader here. Yeah. Hello to Northampton Community Television in Massachusetts. You guys might be the best looking audience we've seen on this side of the camera. That's true. It's great to have you on board. That's true. Matt, uh, any, uh, we, I think we got real mail this week, didn't we? Actually, we did. And um, it comes to us from uh, Ashley Thornton. And Dear Oddballs, enclosed is a hand-carved wooden cross all the way from Vlad the Impaler's, a.k.a. Dracula's hometown, uh, Singasara, Romania. Also, there is a shirt from my paranormal group, uh, Shadow Hills Investigation Team. There is also a $20 donation for, for beer. Yeah. 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 Keep those coming. Beer money. Uh, however, I want you to spend it as you see fit. I love you. The show and have seen every single episode. Yeah, actually, all right. Four That's thing. cool. Right. I could endlessly sing your praises for how much I love Thirty Odd Minutes. Keep up the paranormal work. Sincerely, oh. Ashley. Great. Thanks. What did she send us? Oh, she sent us a um, cross from Romania from Vlad the Impaler's hometown. Like it, she said, it burns, doesn't it? It, it, it yeah, does. Yeah, I figure better safe than sorry. Yeah, no, but good very thing. cool. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you for the T-shirt. We would love to show it, but we can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the initials are kind of funny. Yeah. It's kind of funny. All right. Well, we're in San Francisco. We are going to be talking about haunts today. San Francisco and the surrounding communities boast some of the most famous and well-documented haunts in the world. Between the history, the earthquakes, the fires, and the people, it's no wonder why there are so many ghosts. Tonight, we're going to take a ghostly tour of the city by the bay with the author of the book, Ghost Hunter's Guide to San Francisco Bay. Uh, Bay Area, excuse me. We'll visit haunts like Alcatraz, the Winchester Mystery House, Brookdale Lodge, and more. Our guest has authored numerous books on the paranormal. He's appeared on many radio and television programs, including Ghost Adventures on the Travel Channel. And tonight, he's beaming to the mothership live from the San Francisco Bay. Please welcome Dr. Jeff Dwyer. Good Good to have you here, sir. Thank you so much. Listen, how does a guy with two master's degrees and a Ph.D. in medical science get mixed up in ghosts? What happened? Well, you know, I had that, uh, that traditional experience when I was younger, about 12, 13 years old, and I just couldn't shake it. And despite all the training to be a scientist and think logically and impassionately, I just couldn't uh, give up my notions that the spirit world really exists and ghosts are real. Right. 
Understood. Okay, so you had this calling, and I understand too. You've you've had experiences in the medical community, right? That that kind of yeah. Uh, can well, you just I've worked give us with an a example? lot of patients in ICU and and a lot of dying patients and working in hospitals. They are probably the most haunted locations that you can imagine. It's uh, almost impossible to investigate them, of course, unless they have gone out of business like uh, Linda Vista Hospital in Los Angeles. Sure. But if you go visit a, a hospital that is uh, in business, uh, walk around and you'll see a lot of spirits in there. Right. And, you know, we've, we've heard from people that uh, work in hospitals, nurses, doctors, and so on. It's funny, so few are willing to go on the record, but yet, like you said, they, they have lots and lots of experiences. Um, yeah. Right. Listen, I'm excited because San Francisco is an amazing city. It's beautiful, lots of history, great food, great people. And, and you're going to take us tonight on a tour of, of your hometown, your hometown region. I was hoping we could start, if you don't mind, uh, at Fort Point, right under the Golden Gate Bridge. This is, mm -hmm. um, you know, there it is. There's the Golden Gate Bridge right above uh, Fort Point. There's really two stories here that, that uh, I'd like us to talk about. There's the story of the fort, of course, and then this bridge, which is the number one place on earth for people to commit suicide. Yeah, it really is. The fort was built in 1853, just after the gold rush, when it was realized that California was vulnerable to foreign invasion. So the military started building a fort, didn't finish it till 1861, but it's one of the largest masonry forts in the world. In fact, it rivals uh, Fort Sumter, mm -hmm. um, when it was still standing before the Civil War started, and other forts on the East Coast. It's, it's huge. It never shot, fired a shot in anger, however, but they did fire the cannon quite often. Right, and, and, so, and there were disasters around this fort as well, right? I mean, it wasn't just uh, non-military. I mean, there were shipwrecks. Yeah, there were shipwrecks. In 1901, the uh, SS Rio de Janeiro went up on rocks near the fort, and about 125 people drowned because the lifeboats leaked and there weren't enough uh, uh, life uh, vests on board. So a lot of patients, or a lot of people, made it up out of the rocks. They were hypothermic. They were taken into the fort, died there in the fort. Uh, during that same period, from about 1900 to 1905, a lot of victims of the bubonic plague, which struck San Francisco, were taken to the fort and quarantined there. So an unknown number of people died of the plague during that period of time as well. Right. Now, the, as I mentioned before, you know, the, the Golden Gate Bridge, the number one place on earth, uh, 1,600 documented suicides so far, and counting, of course, as, as that number continues to climb. Uh, what is it about that bridge that calls people to, to do this horrible deed? Well, it's a guaranteed death, one thing, and you jump off that thing and it's 286 feet to water level, and with the acceleration of gravity, when you hit, it's like hitting concrete. So uh, it's pretty certain you're going to die, although there are a few people who went off that bridge and actually survived with serious injuries, but they actually survived and they were lucky enough to be pulled out by the Coast Guard before the sharks got to them. Right. Good God. And when people go off that bridge, it's interesting. They always go off facing the city and the, the city surrounding San Francisco Bay, which I found really curious because it's as if they're taking a last look at something that they are attracted to or something they liked. And I would think that would sort of give them the pause to rethink the whole issue of suicide. If they really wanted to get, get free of this world, they should go off facing west. You see nothing out there but a few rocks called the Farallon Islands. Right. Or they could be looking to see what's chasing them to their death, what they're leaving behind, what caused them to jump. Yeah, good, Matt, point. good point. Yeah. Good point, Good point, yeah. That's, that's an idea, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, do you think that has something to do with, uh, you know, Fort Point? Now, I understand, and we've got another picture inside the casements. You've had an experience in the fort, correct? Yeah, I've had a number of experiences in there, walking around inside of the these casemates, they're called, where the cannon used to sit. You can see some of the windows over there to the left. That was a port through which the cannon was, was pulled up when it was about ready to fire. But all these casemates, there must have been about 50 or 60 of them were filled with cannon. And in walking around in there, I'm, I'm a sensitive, and I pick up on the sounds of the wheels of the cannon kind of grinding on the, the stone uh, pavement below them, and uh, the men talking and boots shuffling about. You pick up all those sounds of all the gunnery practice that went on there for decades. Right. And I've also been up into the barracks area of the fort and, and seen the apparition of boots just from about the knee down walking across the barracks area and then hearing the sound on the floor right and if you think about a place it's, like that it's it's seen all of san francisco's history it watched the city grow it watched the bridge 
get built uh, over above and and um, you know and and stood stood defense like you said never fired a shot in anger but boy there's been an awful lot of death in and around that place anyway. A lot of debt, you know, people from the Golden Gate Bridge, where some, some of them were taken ashore to Fort Point, and we mentioned neck? the shipwreck there, the bubonic plague, the soldiers who died there, some of them thousands of miles from home, being feeling homesick. And when the fort was first built, it was actually some distance from the central part of the city. You couldn't walk into downtown San Francisco from the fort. Right. It was a bit of a horseback ride, maybe five or six miles over sand dunes and through swamps. So it wasn't something that you did on a regular basis. Right, Jeff, we need you to, to point your camera up a little bit. We just suddenly saw your neck. There you go. Uh, hey, welcome back. A yeah. little bit more, a little bit more. <laughs> you, 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 went, you went headless for a second. There it is. All right, no problem. Well, yeah, I got something. <laughs> no, it happens to the best of us. No problem at all. All right, let's move on to the, the, the Neptune uh, Columbarium. Um, tell us about this location. We've got a photo. Oh, Great place. This is a massive structure built in the 1890s. It withstood the 1906 earthquake, and it's one of three burial sites still within the city of San Francisco. All the other cemeteries were emptied and the graves were moved south of the city. This place houses the remains of about 8,000 people, their ashes, and uh, includes some of the city's notables. And when you go through there and you look at these little niches that contain the, the remains, you see some of the really interesting things that people wanted to be buried with. You'll see uh, brandy glasses, for instance, or a bottle of scotch, or uh, toy race cars, or teddy bears. And a lot of them have pictures of the person when they were alive, so you can kind of start to relate to whose ashes are in that place. One of the most famous ghosts there is that of Viola von Staten. She's a little girl who died after the 1906 earthquake because she drank tainted water from a well. And her spirit has been seen walking around in there. And I picked up some really interesting EVP from her as well. Now, have you had personal experiences there? We have a photo of the inside you can see. There it is. Wow, it's it's wow. gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. I've, when I've captured the EVP on my recorder, I actually heard the voice at the same time. So I'm picking up not only the imprint which may be electromagnetic, but also picking up the spirit voice, too. Um, a friend of mine who works there, Emmett, has seen the, this uh, image of Viola. He's talked to her, but I haven't seen her yet. Now, so what I'm you, hoping to do that. What do you think it is about places of the dead, like, like you know, uh, cemeteries, burial location, crypts, and so on? Why, why, would, why would a ghost want to haunt where their ashes are, are left? Why, why do you think uh, there is spirit activity at these places? Well, most of us tend to think that ghosts, that ghosts don't haunt graveyards unless there's some sort of really strong reason for that. Usually it's vandalism of the grave. If the grave has been, been damaged by environmental factors like a flood or something like that, then the ghost shows up to set it right. If the, ghost, if the body's in the wrong grave, the ghost will show up try to get attention to, to correct the error. In the case of Viola, I think that she's there because she's just confused and she doesn't know where else to go. It's very likely that her home was destroyed in the 1906 earthquake. She may have been living out of a tent, therefore felt homeless. And then when she died, she really had nowhere else to go but to stay in this beautiful columbarium. And it is quite beautiful there. And the ashes of her family members are there as well. Right. So that may be keeping her there. Right. Understood. Okay, Matt, Andrew, I got to ask you guys. You guys have spent more time in cemeteries than many undertakers uh, over the years. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Sad but true. <laughs> yeah. Well, what is it about uh, cemeteries, guys? What do you think, Matt, Andrew, that uh, that draws well, ghost stories? Well, I I think um, as he was saying about this location right off the bat is that there are many very personal items that you know belong to the the, the people who are interred there, and I've always felt that that's probably what keeps a lot of spirits around cemeteries is because people are usually buried in their favorite suit or their favorite dress and then quite often everyone I know who's passed away has been buried with something that was very important to them so I think that's the connection to this earthly plane is that very personal item as well as their remains and he was saying that you know uh, he had heard of uh, cemeteries with activity because of bodies being moved and then put back where they weren't originally yeah, on Cape Cod, uh, yep. right near the Bourne, uh, Canal. Bourne Bridge. Yeah. Yeah. There is a cemetery where they had to move people because of the canal, and it was like, eh, I'm not sure if that stone belongs with that coffin. Sure. Well, it's one of the most haunted cemeteries in Massachusetts Correct. because of that. Oh. Spent many a day there. Yeah. Sure. Evening. Yeah. <laughs> No, and, and, and you know, we know when cemeteries get moved, it sounds like a Hollywood cliche where they just move the headstones. It happens all the time. Yep. There's story after story where, you know, uh, they go to cemeteries and they see that the, um, you know, 
the, the plot, there's been no digging in the ground. Just the headstones have been removed. Um, you know, we've come up against that again and again in Pittsburgh and Massachusetts and, and all over the place. And all right, you have um, the ubiquitous Indian burial ground. <laughs> of course. Indian yeah. burial ground, which is everywhere, you know, because they were here for 10,000 years before us. Uh, there were 30, 33 cemeteries moved out of San Francisco as a result of the bubonic plague. Contractors were hired to move the graves. And, you know, it's interesting that if you go to the parks and somewhere along the beach, you'll see broken pieces of headstones. You'll see the words on a piece of stone, rest in peace, or part of someone's name. So they broke up the headstones and used them as pavement around the city and just sent the coffins down the peninsula and put them in a common grave. Right. And do you think, too, there's something, you know, San Francisco, you've got that, that fog rolling in. And, you know, it's the setting, too. Do you th- I mean, is setting part of it? The hills, the fog, the history, the, you know about the earthquakes, the fire, and all that other stuff. Do you think that plays a role well, in someone's psyche? We have earthquake fault to generate electromagnetic fields that make people have hallucinations and maybe tune them in more to the paranormal. But we also have a city surrounded on three sides by salt water that moves rather briskly when the tide goes in and out. And I think that may have a lot to do with attracting spirits and holding on to them. Right. Okay. Jeff, we got to take a quick break for the news. When we come back, we're going to talk about Alcatraz, The Rock, and some more San Francisco haunts. We'll be back right after this. NASA's Mars rover, Curiosity, has sent back to Earth detailed photographs of a spot known as Gale Crater, located in a region of Mars referred to as Yellow Knife Bay. One of the pictures shows an anomaly that to some observers looks like a crystallized flower. Or maybe a piece of quartz. I guess photographic analysis can get a little bit dull, even when the pictures are from another world. In other news, A team of Japanese and American filmmakers have captured the image of a giant squid on video. The film crew shot their video recently while exploring the Pacific Ocean at depths which at times reached 3,000 feet. For centuries, sailors around the world have told tales about sea monsters and encounters with giant squid. Believed to be nothing more than a fisherman's tale, the giant squid has been considered by many to be a cryptid creature, like the Loch Ness Monster. However, this video, along with another shot only a few years ago by a film crew off the coast of Mexico, prove without a doubt that these giant beasts do in fact exist. The squid seen in this recent video is believed to be about the size of a school bus. I bet the Americans were really shocked when they saw the giant squid, and the Japanese were just thinking about lunch. I'm Andrew Lake, and oddly enough, that's the news. Thank you, Andrew, and we're back. Jeff Dwyer, San Francisco, we know there's good sushi out there. we got to ask you, if, if they were serving Kraken, giant squid sushi, would you try it? I don't eat anything raw except vegetables. Yeah. You know what ah. sushi means in Japanese? It means bait. Bait. Right. All right. bait. You uncultured cretins around me. All right, understood. Okay. Okay, you work in an aquatic ecotox <laughs> lab and look what's under raw fish under a microscope and see if you ever eat it. Yeah. I don't care. It tastes delicious, and I'm sticking with that story. All right. As you can see behind us. What's that, Jeff? It's all protein. It's all protein, right. All right. As you can see behind us, we have set the the mothership on hover right here on the water. Alcatraz is behind us. Here it is now in front of us. Tell us about the rock, Jeff Dwyer. Everyone knows about the rock, Alcatraz, this great prison. Why is it so haunted? Well, a lot of people think it's haunted just because of the prisoners that were housed there from about 1934 to 1963, the famous federal prison prisoners. But in fact, when the first Spanish got here at about 1770, they were told that that rock is the home of evil spirits. So these Indians didn't go out there. In fact, the Spanish did nothing with it during the whole time they owned California. When the Mexicans took over in 1820, they did nothing with it during the 26 years they owned California. It was only after the Yankees took over in 1846 that, of course, we went in there and started building military facilities to protect San Francisco Bay. And in about 1860, it started becoming a military prison, and it continued to do that all the way up to about 1925 or so. And during various times, the population would dwindle, but sometimes it was pretty big, and they brought out um, renegade Indians from all over the, the West, housed them there. Confederate soldiers were kept there during the Civil War as prisoners. Uh, There were prisoners during the uh, Spanish-American War, 1898, and also some German prisoners were kept there during during World War I who were considered to be spies. 
So it has a long history of incarcerating prisoners, and during that time, there are an awful lot of deaths that took place, many of them unrecorded. Right, and surrounded by water, of course, the ultimate uh, high fence. You know, you, if, you, uh, if you do manage to escape, it's a long swim uh, through cold water to, to get to land. Um, and, and there's something romantic about it. And, of course, the movies that get made, it, becomes, it gets part of our collective consciousness to think about a place like Alcatraz. And, you know, you get into the nature of what is a ghost. Is a ghost because this place is so famous that I want to tap into what was here? I want to see Capone. I want to see, you know, whoever was, uh, whatever famous inmates may have been here for a time. Um, you know, I'm just curious about that connection to the past. Yeah, there are, there's a... Tons of imprints out there, and largely that's what people experience when they go out there, imprint phenomena created by repetitive, intensely emotional experiences like pain and fear that living people experience. They lay these down on the environment, and when you go there, you'll pick up the, the essence of the, the emotion. You'll, you'll pick up sounds and things like that. But also there are ghosts there, I think, who are trapped by the salt water and uh, maybe trapped there by for other reasons. You know, for some prisoners who were there, this was actually not a bad spot because they had three square meals a day, a warm cot, and medical care. For some of them, it was actually the best care they had in their lives. Right. All right, let's stay on the water for a minute and just he head up to Alameda to the USS Hornet, another place uh, synonymous with ghosts. Because it's been so popular, it's been on so many paranormal shows, we saw, you know, um, you know we, we've seen it on, on just about all of them, I think. The Hornet saw a lot of action, um, you know, in battle, and, and a lot of, you know, a lot of medals, a lot of, a lot of death on this ship. Um, you know, what, tell us a little bit more about this, uh, this storied battleship. It was, um, rather, it was launched late in uh, 1943. It saw a lot of action. It was engaged. It was attacked 59 times during World War II. Mm -hmm. It shot down 1,400 enemy airplane and sank over a million tons of Japanese shipping, but the cost was high. There were over 300 deaths on board this ship. So about 60 or 80 of them were pilots who crashed. There were three men who were decapitated by the arresting cables on the deck and another 30 who walked into propellers or got hit by jet blast. And then there were quite a few suicides. In fact, the Hornet has the dubious distinction of being the ship with the greatest number of suicides of any Navy vessel. So all totally, you've got about 300 deaths on that ship. And our investigations out there suggest that this ship has become a portal. We've run into spirits out there who never served in the Navy, who were never on that ship, but we know they are there. Right. And, and we've got a photo you sent us. Uh, check out this photo, folks, um, that, that uh, Jeff sent us. Tell us about what we're looking at here. Okay, it's a little hard to see on my monitor, but on that left, there's a orb taken on the flight deck. Now, most of us don't think much of orbs, but the fact that three men were decapitated on the flight deck, and we got an orb with a skull in, in the middle of it that's quite visible when you look at the original image, uh, that's pretty interesting to me. That uh, is more corroborating suggestion that this may be, in fact, paranormal and not some fluke from the camera's operating uh, deficiencies. Over on the, the right, we've got an infrared image taken down in the engine room. And that bright uh, figure in the center of the picture is that of a person wearing the typical fireman's outfit. We had firemen in the engine room while the ship was in operation, and they wore these heavy uniforms. They were probably asbestos, and uh, we picked this up on infrared. You may not see it on your monitor, but in the foreground, you can see the images of some living persons who are down there investigating with us. Right. But this is another indication of somebody in the engine room, and probably a ghost. Right. No, that's, I mean, that's incredible. And we, we've heard, again, countless stories of it. Uh, you know, water. Water seems to be a recurring theme here. I mean, we're on the bay. And, uh, and, and let's, let's go to another place with more water, Brookdale Lodge. Now, I know this place is near and dear to you because of your childhood. Let's, let's start. There it is, Brookdale Lodge. Let's start uh, as, as a kid. What, what happened to you when you yeah. were a, a child there? Uh, we went there when I was about 12 years old or so, and I was down at the edge of the creek uh, just looking for frogs, and I felt a, a presence, uh, someone leaning next to me. I thought it was my sister who had come down next to the creek with me, and I turned, looked out of the corner of my eye, and sure enough, it was a girl with long blonde hair and a white dress on. I thought, that's my sister. Just then, my mother called out to me from up on the patio to get away from the water, and as I looked up, my sister was standing next to her. So my conclusion is that this person next to me was the ghost of Sarah Logan, who drowned in that creek probably about 1918. 
Right. Her spirits have been seen there many, many times. I've gone back and seen her two or three times since then. Right. Now, th now the creek, what a lot of people may not realize who haven't been there, the creek runs through the middle of the hotel slash restaurant. Take a look. Here's the, um, here's a photo of it. So you were down. Yeah, there it is. Beautiful. So, so right, right there, the, uh, the Brook Room, um, you know, the, the creek runs right through the middle. Uh, incredible. That yeah, this is a huge room built as a dining hall, and the creek runs through it. The, the banks were, were set up with rocks so that the erosion would be minimal, and then all the tables are set up around it, and the kitchen is in behind that wall that you see. And this place was really popular in the 20s and 30s, and in the 40s it became a hangout for Hollywood people. Even President Hoover, Herbert Hoover went there. In the 50s it became a hangout for mobsters, if you will, gangsters from Las Vegas and L.A. who came up there because Brookdale was still pretty isolated. And they could have their meetings and carry on some of their business without anybody nosing around, including the police. Right. All right. Jeff, if we could head south now, uh, there's a place that uh, you know, fascinates me, the Winchester Mystery House uh, down in oh, San yeah. Jose. This is, you know, there's, a, there's the external uh, of this incredible. Can, can you give us the quick recap of the incredible story behind this mansion? Yeah, this place was built over a period of 40 years. It was built by Sarah Winchester, who was told by Psychic that she has to continually build this place 24-7. Uh, if she ever stopped, she would die. So she continued for nearly 40 years, spent $5 million on this place. Uh, construction ended in 1922 with 700 rooms. Today, only 160 remain, but it's still enough to get lost in that place. Right, and, and, and it's... Uh, it's believed to be a portal for spirits who had died at the hands of the Winchester repeating arms. And she was the heir to the Winchester rifle fortune. And to make amends for all those deaths, she had to make this, this portal for these spirits to move in and out of our world. And, of course, the building's very confusing. There are stairways that go nowhere. There's rooms with, you know, uh, just, you know, no windows. There's all kinds of unique architecture. And apparently uh, Sarah would just sketch out on a napkin and hand it to the foreman, right? I mean, sometimes. That yeah, was... she had a seance every night in the seance room. The spirits would give her directions. And in the morning, she would hand her notes to the foreman, who was directed to go ahead and start building, literally without any more blueprints than what her sketch was on the napkin or the scrap piece of paper she had. And it's believed she was building this place uh, at the direction of spirits, but she also built it in a way that would confuse spirits that were evil or trying to do her harm, and hence the stairways that go up to the ceiling and go no further, and the doors that open to another wall. So it's got a lot of curiosity around her. Plus, I believe it's sitting over a, con a uh, intersection of ley lines, and that may be why there's a, such a strong attachment of spirits at this place. And how would you love to be the foreman on that job for 40 years? Right? Is that the sweetest gig ever? Guys, we are, we're set. As long as this lady lives, we are just going to keep building and building, yeah. and uh, let's have it. You got it. And the word was that she paid two or three times what locals were paying for carpenters, and they were housed on the grounds and fed quite well. She had an income of $1,000 a day, which is a lot of money back in the late 19th century and early 20th century. And she had, a, had inherited a bulk sum of $20 million in 1883. Wow. She was very, very wealthy. We, you know, we need, we need a, a wealthy heiress like that to adopt 30-odd minutes and just keep funding us. All right, uh, real quick, I want to get to this, this photo because this is pretty incredible. Take a look at this photo Jeff sent us inside the Winchester Mystery House. There's, a, there's Sarah Winchester, and, and uh, I know it's tough for you to see, Jeff, but tell us about this photo um, in the Oriental bedroom. Well, on the left, we have the standard. Now, there were only two photographs that are known to exist of Sarah Winchester. She was very, very shy, I guess, private. This was snapped by a workman who sort of took it surreptitiously from a bush. And you get an idea of her facial features. Uh, over on the right, we have a picture snapped in the oriental bedroom. And it's really hard to see on my monitor. But right in the center of the picture, down low, right. is that same face. I now, know. Sarah was only four foot ten. Right, amazing stuff. So if stuff. she was sitting on a stool or bench back there, her head would be very low relative to that table you see right. in the picture. Understood. Jeff, we are right up to the end of the show. Thank you so much for joining us. The name of the book, Ghost Hunter's Guide to the San Francisco Bay Area. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Dwyer. Until next time, stay on. Yeah. Ah.